Hey, what's up, everybody? Sol Manikbal here. Welcome back to my channel. You can find me on Twitter at Sol Manikbal, trainer at LearnK8. On this channel, we talk about everything cloud native. In this video, we'll talk about what actually happens when you try and create a pod in Kubernetes cluster, how it uses the various interfaces, and what happens when a service is involved for a pod. So let's get started. Imagine you have this red web page you'd like to deploy to a Kubernetes cluster of your own choice. Just like before, you've seen you write a deployment file that looks something like this and you say how many replicas you'd like to have of the website running at all times. Let's see what happens when you submit the request. You as a user send the request to Kubernetes cluster and say, please create me a deployment to replicas using a command, something like kubectl apply minus f deployment.yaml. The request is received by the API server in the control plane. If you'd like to understand how the API server works, I have a video on this channel that explains that. You can click on the link in description to find out what happens inside the API server when it receives the request. The request then carries on to the etcd database, controller manager, and then to the scheduler to decide which one of the nodes the pod is going to be deployed to. If you'd like to understand how the scheduler decides that, I have another video that explains that in detail, and you can check it out on my channel. It is linked in the description. At this point, the pod only exists in etcd database and not in any of the nodes. So whose job is it to actually create a pod, I hear you say? Well, it turns out that on every worker node in the cluster, there is this binary called kubelet. And the purpose of the kubelet is to ask the control plane regularly, is there any pod for me to deploy? So does a kubelet create the pod itself? Well, no, it doesn't. Kubelet is great at delegating. So the first thing the kubelet does is delegate the creation of the container to CRI, the Container Runtime Interface. In simple terms, CRI is in charge of starting and stopping containers. Currently, Docker is the most common runtime used. You can also use Container D or Cryo. So CRI is just starting and stopping containers. There is more that needs to be done. We now have a pod that is up and running in one of our worker nodes. Next comes in CNI or Container Network Interface. When the container is up and running, the job of the CNI is to attach the container to the network and also assign an IP address to the container. The kubelet reports the IP address to the control plane, so it can be used to send some traffic to the pod when required. Kubelet also checks three probes, which are liveness, readiness, and finally, startup probes. Probes are a topic in itself, and if you'd like me to make a video on it, let me know in the comments. Let's just say that the probes report that everything is A-OK. -okay. Kubelet is not done yet. There is more. The CSI, no, nope, not that one, the container storage interface. Let's say the pod needed to connect to the volume of any kind and read and write data to it. That's where the container storage interface comes in. It mounts volume to a given pod or unmount it when not needed. So there we have it. That is how Kubernetes creates a pod. If the pod was not part of a service, this video would end here. But in most of the times, pods are usually part of the service. Wait, what? Service? What is a service, I hear you ask? So the IP that we saw a pod gets assigned, that can change, for example, if the pod restarts. So a service is just an abstraction layer that sits on top of a pod or sets of pods. Instead of us directly calling the pod, we can call upon a service that always knows what the latest IP address of the pod is. So how do we define a service? Well, we write a sweet, sweet YAML file. In YAML, we say which pod the service needs to select, and more importantly, which port is the container inside the pod running on. We submit this to the Kubernetes by running kubectl apply minus f service.yaml. Kubernetes creates the service, and also it creates an endpoint. And endpoint is the IP address and the port of the pod put together. Additionally, for every service that Kubernetes creates, it also creates an endpoint object with all the endpoints listed in it. You can see in this case, this endpoint has multiple IP addresses. That is because the service is pointing to three pods. So we have pods, we have service, we have endpoints. So who uses these endpoints? Once we know the IP address of the pod and the kubelet notifies the IP address to control plane. And if this pod is associated with a service, the endpoint object is created. And every time this endpoint object is modified, a number of things get notified. 
QProxy gets notified. It uses this information to set IP table rules. Then we have core DNS that needs to update the DNS entries. And if there's an ingress controller, it is notified. It needs to adjust the rules to route external traffic to the pod. Perhaps you're running a service mesh that also needs to be notified of the endpoint. Even if you have operators that are running, they need to be notified too. In short, anything that needs to send traffic to the pod or uses the information has to be notified of the endpoint. Once the endpoint is propagated, you can finally start using the pod. Hooray! Can you guess what happens when you try and delete a pod? Well, exactly the same process, but in reverse. So, in summary, when we submit a request to the cluster to create a pod, the kubelet is in charge of creating it. It calls upon the CRI to create the pod, then onto the CNI to attach it to the network and assign it an IP address. Then comes in the CSI, in case we need to mount any volumes. If there is a service associated with the pod, an endpoint object is created. The endpoint includes the pod IP and port pair. Once the endpoint is created, then a number of components such as QProxy are notified of the change and the pod is ready to be used. Hope that gave you a bit more understanding and appreciation of what actually happens when you try and create a pod. If you'd like more detail on this topic, I have included some links in the description below. If you'd like to see more content like this, please consider subscribing to the channel, sharing with your friends and colleagues. Until next time, thank you very much for listening and stay safe.